future. For tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. For every budding student eager to prepare themselves for tomorrow, we present to you Daksh 2022. Members of the audience, a very good morning to one and all present here. Christ University is proud to welcome you all to this edition of Daksh, the annual flagship event of the university. I am Muskan Tiwari and I will be your MC for the day. Daksh, the annual education and career guidance fair hosted by the Student Council of Christ deemed to be university, is a one-stop destination for all things education. At Daksh, you get to witness exclusive opportunities, imperative student guidance, acquire varied knowledge and make informed choices regarding your education and your careers. Without any further ado, we present to you today's session, Career in Healthcare, Drug Development, Research and Scope of Biomedical Sciences. We are beyond honored to have amidst us Suresh Ramu, our esteemed speaker for today. Suresh Ramu, co-founder co -founder and director of SiteSpace Research and Medwell Ventures, is a senior management professional and entrepreneur involved in the setup and growth of organizations. He is currently working on improving cancer care outcomes in India and healthcare delivery best practices. He has a master's in business administration from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He is very passionate about patient centricity, quality, technology, and creating a value-based, performance-driven culture in healthcare organizations. With a work experience of 17 years, he has been working in improving efficiencies and effectiveness of the clinical research industry for the past two decades. Sir, it is an absolute privilege to have you here at Daksh. We request you to kindly take the dais. doesn't come in the way. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Okay, good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to be away from this fan. I must thank uh, the organizers, the enthusiasm here, the professors, Professor Sebastian, thank you so much, Lynette Nazareth, who actually introduced me to this uh, gorgeous event today. Uh, but more than anything else, I think, you know, I came prepared with a certain uh, set of slides, and then I happened to have to park at the front entrance. Can we just switch it off? Yeah. Just yeah, switch it off. At the front entrance of uh, Christ College, Christ University. And the walkthrough, I think, was more educational in terms of what this university and the students here are doing than any brochure that I have seen or any website that I could have uh, picked up. So congratulations to all of you who have created this event and are participating in it and who are making this an event a great success. I'm an engineer by qualification. I finished my chemical engineering in 1995 uh, from IIT Madras. I was very enthusiastic uh, to join chemical engineering other than I didn't want to get into any other fields. I had a certain idea about chemical engineering before I went into it. Uh, and it was obviously very different to what I learned over the next four years from 91 to 95 in, in Chennai. I born and brought up in Pune, so for me the transition from Pune to Chennai itself was a big one. Uh, anybody here from Pune? Yeah, there you go, there are a few. 
So Pune is very different. It was very different. It is still very different. Similarities to Bangalore in many, many ways, but from a weather perspective. But Chennai was completely culturally different. So for me, it was a cultural shock uh, to go to Chennai. Though originally I'm a Tamil, so language was not an issue, and yet I was in a complete state of shock. So education started actually before the classes started because uh, I was almost ready to go back home. Uh, I said, this is not for me. I don't like this city. But in six months' time, what I picked up is that the city has its own charm. There is something about it that is unique, something that I began to enjoy. And in fact, when I was leaving four years later, I almost didn't want to leave Chennai. Went back to Mumbai, and uh, anybody from Mumbai here? Yeah, so Mumbai monsoons, if anybody has experienced, you have to live there to experience it. And I went and joined this chemical engineering company because you know that was all I wanted to do, right? I, I finished my engineering and I said, I must stay back in India. 40 out of 43 of my batchmates had gone off to the US and three of us, and I said, I must take up a job in India, be here. And I got on this first day and joined Larson and Tubro, which is a very large uh, organization at that point of time as well. And I get into the gates and you know, the first day uh, in Mumbai was the heaviest possible rains I've ever experienced in my life. And I said, what kind of a city is this? Uh, and I had to take three buses and you know, somehow manage to reach work. And I said, this is a disastrous place. I do not want to be in Mumbai ever. Believe it or not, in about six, seven months, I saw a very different perspective of Mumbai. I loved Mumbai. I mean, the, the kind of energy, the professional attitude, the never say die attitude, you know, the people here from Mumbai will agree on that. I mean, there is something about Mumbai that you cannot get anywhere else, right? And I started loving Mumbai, saying this is the place to be. And I so happened to meet somebody along the way who's, who came across like a career counselor suddenly from nowhere. And he completely brainwashed me to say, you know, you're wasting your life. Get out of here. Do an MBA. Get out. I was like, really? I don't want to do anything else. I want to do engineering. You know, this is, this is it. This is my dream job. I got it. Um, no, 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 no. You're wasting your life. Somehow I got convinced or whatever. And I wrote the CAT exam and I went off to IM Calcutta. And I, you know, from the west now to the east. Anybody from Calcutta here? There you go. There are a few. There are a few from every place here, right? And it was month one, and it's quite intense in IIMs, but uh, Calcutta is supposed to be the most relaxed of the IIMs in those days as well as probably today. Attendance is not so compulsory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to do your own things and stuff. But assignment was supposed to be submitted tomorrow morning, and obviously I was late, and everybody else in my class was doing this late in the night and trying to figure out so if you have to submit it to, and you have to submit it not online. In those days, 1996, you have to submit it hard copy. Yeah, you have to spiral bound, bind it, and stuff like that. So I decide to go and get the spiral binding done outside. So in campuses in Joka, take a walk out, take a bus to Thakur Pukur, from Thakur Pukur take another bus, and get to the shop. And the shop, it is already eight o'clock in the night, or 7.50 or thereabouts in the evening, and the shop is open, and I've got my computer or pen drive, or, what, or my, I don't think it was a pen drive, it was a floppy disk or whatever it was, and I said, I need this dada, I need this printout, and this guy is ready to shut his shop, because it's, and uh, he said, it's closed, the shop is closed, and I said, it's not closed, you know, it's open. And I can see the printer, I can see the paper, you know, print it. This is, you know, I, I can't go anywhere else. Print it for me. I said, it's closed. It's over. Please go. And he didn't print it. I said, I'll pay extra. I'll pay double because I come from Mumbai, you know. Mumbai, you can pay double and get whatever you want, right? He said, it's closed. Don't you understand? Hobena. So 
it was like, what kind of a place is this? Completely unprofessional. But you begin with that, and then suddenly, you dissolve into the cultural environment of that city. And over the next two years, I was, you know, we used to go to Park Street, and we used to have the fun food there, we had the cultural programs there, the metro was, the, that was the first metro in the country that ever existed. Now you have metro everywhere, but that was the first metro, and super clean, right? The metro in Kolkata was always the pride of the city, and everything outside will be dirty, but nothing inside it was absolutely spectacularly clean. They had pride. They, they loved their city, right? I mean, they loved their state. They loved their... And you love that, the fact that there is pride. So why I'm saying all of this is that while we come into a certain area, domain, with a certain set of mindsets, what you learn from there, if you're willing to learn, takes you on a better journey. So my entry into healthcare was also similar. I joined a dream job after my MBA into consulting, uh, you know, day one or day zero as whatever it is called. And you know, I thought it was, I'm done, you know, this is it for my life. And I'm doing too well in two years and somebody says, get into this startup company, you know, telemedicine. And this is 99, 2000, which is before broadband. We used to have Videsh Sanchar Nigam Limited, 64 kbps dial-up telephone lines in those days. And I, somebody said, go into this, right? And I joined that firm. That was my introduction to healthcare. I used to travel a lot in rural, semi-rural, semi-urban India, selling software products uh, to doctors to connect them to the specialists who are based in the larger cities because there is a gap because the patients who are in the semi-urban areas do not have access to the specialists who are largely concentrated, even today, in the big cities or metros. And that was my introduction to healthcare. And I thought, what am I doing, a chemical engineer, an MBA, a consultant, uh, doing in a startup telemedicine company? And I think I learned in one and a half years more than what I could have learned maybe in many, many years. Because in startups, you've got to do everything. It was everything, literally everything, right? I became the courier boy. I became the software developer. I was a product manager. I was a marketing guy. I was an ISO champion, whatever, right? Moved on to join a clinical research company. I had no idea about clinical research, drug development, nothing. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of a growth story called a company called Quintiles. And uh, we grew it to seven, 8,000 people. 2011, exited and started a few companies. And here I am 10 years or 11 years after that, um, standing in front of you. What I'm trying to say is that as students, one of the big things that we need to take away, and I mean students as myself, as much as you are a student, is that what are you constantly changing about yourself? What are you willing to let go? And what are you willing to acquire about yourself? If you have that window in your brain every day, every moment, you will be successful because the human mind and brain is extraordinarily powerful. So anything that you have done, you can connect it back into healthcare. So I will get to healthcare opportunities, but I just thought it's important to have extraordinary open mind first in anything that you want to do. And I think success will follow you if you have that built in. So let's go forward to talk a little bit about healthcare. I mean, healthcare is a broad topic. People know much about it. I was saying earlier, nobody cared about healthcare before the pandemic hit. Uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, there's a side benefit that everybody understands. Vaccines, people have heard about drug development. People know about uh, life cycle of treatment. People know booster. People know RT-PCR. Uh, you know, things like that, which were unheard of as terminologies in healthcare. Right? Nobody would have dreamt to say that the common person would be even speaking a language uh, of that includes healthcare two years ago. So it's everything from birth to death, from wellness to illness, 
and beyond. So beyond is because we also deal with families. We talk about counseling. We talk about psychology. We talk about so many different things that need to be dealt with, financial management, financial planning, legal cases for post-death. So the entire spectrum of healthcare touches all elements from birth to death and beyond. Every single area, and these are only few areas on the left side, has opportunities, specifically coming to clinical trials. How many of you have an overview understanding of clinical trials? Please raise your hands. Just a little bit. Do you understand clinical trials? Anybody? A little bit? Yeah? Yeah? Maybe about 10 hands, is that right? Am I saying? Okay. Maybe 20 now, 25. Okay, that's pretty good. So every drug, every device, medical device, needs to go through development. Because you can't just say, hey, I've got a great idea. I think this will work. I mean, this is like 500 years ago or 300 years ago. You have human volunteers or sick patients who will be tested out without consent or without any prior information or without validity or proof to say, let me try this out on you. You know, maybe it will work, maybe you'll die, but let me try it out. That's not acceptable anymore, right? We are living in the 22nd century, if not the 21st, yeah? And this is only going to change as we proceed. So you need a lot of prior processes to ensure that human clinical development processes are safe, first of all, so safety, and then what is called efficacy, which means, does it work? Is it efficacious? Does it work or does not work? If you compare it with an existing drug or device, is it better or worse or at least equal? And are there other benefits that justify the existence of this new product that we are bringing to market? Or an existing product that has newer applications, an existing drug that was repurposed for the treatment of COVID-19, for example, is a classic example of using clinical development processes, right? It goes through a variety of phases in development, starting from broadly research and development, where you have a conversation with clinicians, with scientists, you have an idea in the lab. It's called preclinical, where you do animal testing, um, you know, a variety of animal testing, and some of you any animal enthusiasts, activists who love animals? Yeah, anybody here who love animals? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, is it fair to try things on animals before you try it on humans, right? And I think there's a lot of conversation and debate around how do you optimize this or not do it, right? This is the area of animal and lab testing. And the second is, what is broadly called clinical research. Clinical means human. Anything that you hear clinical is human. Preclinical means before human. So clinical research is human development. That means you're trying it out on, first of all, on healthy male, by the way, volunteers in small numbers, but you inject a drug into a healthy person and see wh what happens to that person. So that person is put in an in a ICU-like environment um, where everything is available, monitoring is happening real time, and you monitor all aspects of how the drug, what is called the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics happen for the drug in that human being. And you test it in a small number of human volunteers to say that uh, I think it is safe to be taken uh, in humans. And then you move to the next phase, which is called phase two, which is efficacy safety and efficacy. So you test it again in terms of what dose is the right dose? How do you know this is the right dose? How do you know that you have to do it twice a day or once a day or three times a day or once a year or whatever, right? The dose studies. A lot of studies have to, have to happen before it goes to what is called a phase three where a larger number of patients are taken into the trial and then you test it out and you study their data and you say, are there long-term effects? Are there short-term effects? What is happening to the drug? Is it really safe to be marketed into, uh, for a large number of patients for that specific indication? That is clinical research. 
Third is health services related. So not all of us are part of a clinical trial. Anybody here has participated in a clinical trial, by the way? Any hands that I can see, clinical trial? Anybody? I can't see any hands, is that correct? Okay. So everybody can participate in a clinical trial. There is uh, enough and it's an experience by itself. Um, and there are benefits and we can talk about that. But the health related assessments are after the trial. So the marketed drugs are already there and what can you do to manage the health related? Can we invest in new molecules? Are there opportunities for investment? How can I be sure that the appropriate use of those molecules are there? Are there other areas where I can use an existing molecule? For example, you know, a, a, a funny story because I've never gained weight in my last so many years. And way down back uh, when I was maybe in the early 20s or so, um, one guy came and told me that, look, you can take this drug because the side effect of it is weight gain. Uh, maybe you should try it out. And I actually tried it for a year. It didn't work for me. But the, the, the larger point being that there are drugs that are repurposed and you need to study them again to say that are there side effects that I can now leverage uh, to do or there are devices that I can modify. A lot of this comes through the conversations in terms of post-marketing with the doctors, with the scientists. And of course, you have to exit. A lot of news about Pfizer investing so many billion dollars and uh, creating the molecule. E-Biological now with Corbavex for 12 to 14 year olds. Where did that duck, drug come from? If you don't have the money, how can you invest, right? These are expensive studies. If you're gonna do controlled studies, collect high quality data, regulatory authorities are gonna challenge you. It's not cheap, it it's costs millions of dollars sometimes. So capital investment and divestment is a whole field by itself in healthcare and biotechnology or biosciences. Um, I spoke a little bit about it already, so I don't want you to dwell on the, the details of the slide, but essentially there is a path for drug development and every single stage of drug development, for example, has enormous number of opportunities. There are opportunities for people who know how to write well, good English, good communication. There are people, there are jobs for people who are project managers who can organize events um, or who can organize scheduled things that can happen or manage teams. There's enormous opportunity in every stage apart from the clinical or the scientific requirements that are necessary for um, conducting clinical research. But moving into what are the key skills that employers look for, you know? So what do people look for, you know? And I'm sure you've heard this every time, but it's not so easy, actually. When you get into a job environment, it's very different. Like the stories that I had about moving to a new city, uh, it's the same. You've got to be ready to understand before you hate. I learned that much later in my life, or to learn, but I think when I look back, all of those different experiences is what makes you a better person. So self-motivation, we have heard about this, of course. Are you self-motivated? Um, how do you know you're self-motivated? What goals are you achieving that you set out for yourself that you're achieving in the time frame that you defined for yourself? Are you sure that you're achieving those goals in the time frame? Do you have time management skills. You came all on time, that was great to see that this, apparently the doors of this hall shut and the classroom shut and the discipline here is fantastic. I think as we move into a next way of working, work from anywhere culture, right? We are all moving into a work from anywhere culture, right? Um, their time management has its own meaning. Uh, how do you manage work? How do you manage life? How do you prioritize deliverables? How do you create impact? Creativity and innovation. A lot can be said about this. How do you demonstrate it in your workplace is your challenge because the workplace itself is a new thing for you when you're going to get into a job. Are you an independent thinker? Do you have an idea? Do you have a way of thinking? Are you open to feedback? Are you open to listen? Do you understand 
what you genuinely believe? Are you able to use data to take decisions? How good are you in communication? And a lot we can talk about on communication, actually, maybe in the Q&A. And teamwork, you know, this event, for example, cannot be possible without teamwork. I'm sure there are some people who worked harder than other people, some people who take more of the credit than the other people. All of that is normal life in a job as well. But that's not the point. The point is, what have you been able to achieve together? Sometimes that is more important than individual success and individual showcasing what you have achieved. I think uh, sometimes we get trapped in this world of saying that I did this, I need to see it for myself, versus what is the impact of what we're trying to achieve. You know, there are, this is just not for reading, by the way. I just wanted to put it up there, because this is an example. Uh, recently, I got it, actually, for one of the candidates whom we were trying to recruit uh, at a mid-level position. And the number of performance appraisal uh, parameters that were put up is amazing to see. And I wonder who has all of this cap capabilities. So if you really believe it, uh, I don't think anybody is going to be an expert. But are there certain things that you are really good at is what I would ask you. What are those things that you know for a fact that you're good at and a fact that you can develop even better? What is it that you enjoy doing the most? Is, are there things that you really enjoy? Now, don't tell me that the only thing I enjoy doing is having a cup of tea with my friends or you know, singing all day. So if you do do that, then please get into that as a career option, or you figure out that that is not a career option, and I really enjoy certain things that I want to do in my life. So that is the question that I would ask you, is that there are so many different behavioral competencies that are expected in a job. The question is, how do you fit in and this is generic, I think. This can be applied to any organization, not just healthcare. How do you fit in? What do you bring to the table which is unique, which is not a copy-paste, because you're unique as a person? What is it that you bring, and what is it that you can use that to showcase value to your team, to your organization, is the question. Bringing me to the point about Values, a subject matter that is often not discussed. But if you go back to the core of who you are, you probably have certain belief systems. You probably, you know, when I was much younger, I used to say, how can people eat non-vegetarian food? I'm a vegetarian, you know, brought up in a very conservative family. Uh, so for me, impossible to imagine myself sitting across the table with somebody who's eating non-vegetarian food, um, some of the choices, in fact, of friendships, of uh, collaborations were probably determined by what they eat. Religion was important. Uh, you know, who you interact with was driven by religious motivation sometimes. And over a period of time, obviously, because I think I had the fortune of being part in different parts of the country, meeting different kinds of people, and subsequently as well in the last 20 years, traveling to a large number of places in the world. And I love traveling. I love traveling into the interiors of India. I've traveled a lot into places that many of you may not have uh, visited at all, into rural India. I think there is a unifying factor. And if you begin to recognize that as more important than superficial values like religion or language or food yeah, or dress or whatever, or gender even, I think the point is you will then begin to say what is really deep down what you believe in? What is it that is necessary for you to believe in? Why I'm saying this is that is what will reflect back in your life 20, 30 years from now. And if you start recognizing that and developing that, you probably are going to have a higher chance of success in terms of selecting or making the right decisions in career choices, uh, collaborating with the right kind of people, and finding the opportunities that otherwise you will miss out because of the programming that has happened for the last 20 years in your life, right? It's because all of us are programmed, but in different ways. But the programming is critical to recognize. 
right or wrong is your decision, but at least recognize it. And I think these are values at Sitecare. We respect everybody. Every person, the security guard, is respected. The doctor, the super specialist, is respected. And we make a lot of effort to make that possible. All the rewards and recognitions are available for everybody. We want to see teamwork in action. We want to see integrity. When the most difficult things happen, not any one of us in this room can claim to say that they have never lied in, that li in their life, right? We have all lied. And we continue to lie today. Small lies, big lies, that's a different matter. But the grades of gray, as they call it, the shades of gray, as they call it. But the point is that do you recognize it? And are you making an effort to improve on it? That's all that matters. If you're making an improvement, then you will be successful. You will do better than yesterday. Grit is a particularly important one before I hand over to questions, is that it's perseverance and determination. Are you truly, do you have grit? You got the grit to get into a college, into a university, to complete a course. Of course it requires grit. It's not easy, you know, some subjects you hate, some subjects you love, but you have to go through it, you know, whatever. The point is, can you take that to the next level in terms of understanding whether you have the, uh, it within you to persevere and to complete actions that require grit? And I think as you proceed in a work life, this becomes one of the differentiation factors between one person and the other that are you willing to work hard today and finish it because you made a commitment, you have the grit despite all difficulties. By the way, just going back to the Calcutta example, I did find a printer, but I had to go back, travel one more hour extra um, into the Park Street area, spend a lot more money to get there, and the shops were open till 9.30 p.m., and I was able to do my printout and I came back to my campus. But I, I didn't realize, or I don't know if that is grit, but it does matter in every day of your lives. The career opportunities in healthcare are known for those who have been in medicine and nursing. A little bit more about people who are in science, the biotechnology area, or biology area, or chemistry area. To some extent, people have an understanding that there are opportunities maybe in the labs, in cell development, in gene therapy, in gene editing. There are things that are happening all over the world. There are opportunities that you have a certain sense about. And I will not take too much time on that because that is much easier. I think what is often not understood is arts, architecture, the ability to write well, the ability to communicate well, journalism, huge opportunities. Architecture, the hospital cannot be built without architects who are healthcare architects. In fact, hospital architects, right? And um, if you go to the US and even in India now, you see actually specialized architects who are only hospital architects. But in the US, you will have architects and even further, you've got something called medical planners. And those are not, those are not people with the medicine background, but they have learned about how a patient flow happens, what are the medical uh, necess needs of delivery of services, how do I make this design uh, a lot more patient-centric? And you know, there's a whole thing about patient-centricity, design, design thinking. There is a whole, whole, whole area, obviously, about application of technology, right? How does your Arogya Setu app work? How does your, how do you have, the, India has the largest, I think is the only country probably which has these many numbers of uh, vaccine certificates online, right? You can go wherever you want and just show this thing on your phone, which is outstanding. It's unbelievable what has happened in India, right? So application of computer science with an understanding of healthcare and biosciences is the convergence that I want you all to take away from this slide. No career today is verticalized or siloed. No career. Every single career has intersections with other verticals. And if you, if you appreciate that, then I think you can find your niche based on what you have already studied 
or what you're going to study, what you're good at or what you're going to be good at, and figuring out where you enjoy that intersections the most. And there is a lot of money in all those intersections if you're good. Thank you. Okay, so how much time do I have? Uh, sir, we've got 15, 20 minutes. Okay, there. perfect. So we will take uh, questions and answers. Yes, sir. Or I request comments, the audience. Uh, no to need for questions if you want to do a comment, yeah? If you want to just a comment, that's fine as well. All right. So if you've got a comment or a question, yes, kindly raise your hand and our volunteers will bring the mic over to you. All right. Uh, till the time they're thinking of questions, we have a few questions for you, sir. What are the monetary prospects for somebody working in diagnostic medicine, according to you? Monetary what are the monetary prospects for, for someone working in diagnostic medicine? Diagnostic medicine. So, what is diagnostics? You want to know what the problem is. Yeah? With a patient, typically a patient, but it could be also unknown, which is, means you're a healthy person, but you want to do a health check. That is, you want to know that your car or your scooter is fine. So it's called a preventive health check, yeah? Or a diagnostic, which is more specific because you have a symptom and you're targeting the symptom and saying, what is going to, what is the real root cause of this symptom, right? Um, there are many different word types of medicine, allopathy to maybe Ayurvedic and some argue whether homeopathy fits in there or not. Unani and I, you know, there are many, many types of medicine and each has an approach to figure out root cause or a certain cause, if not the root cause, and deal with it. Allopathy for most parts is symptomatic in terms of its diagnosis and treatment, whereas some of the other sciences may try and go deeper into, for example, mental health, uh, mental well-being that results in physical distress. So diagnostics is a huge spectrum that goes from triggering to, so you're, you're trying to find a solution to the problem. So diagnostics has changed dramatically because of technology. So today, or maybe just a few years ago, um, to diagnose certain types of cancers, the only way to do that was to do a biopsy, do a cut and open and take a biopsy. Today, there are certain tests and certain ways of doing a biopsy that are daycare procedures, which means the patient doesn't need to be admitted, you can just figure it out in the morning and you can get the results in the, in the same day. A lot of genetic tests, biomarkers, are now available to understand what is the predisposition of this person and how do you use that to find the right modalities of treatment. So diagnostics is a huge range. Technology is rapidly changing. So if you are on the cutting edge, on the few cutting edges or the convergences of tech and health, or biomedical and health, or biomedical and computer science, or any other vertical that I showed you on that, even medical writing, for example, but you're on the diagnostic side, you will find extraordinary interesting opportunities in the diagnostic space. But diagnostics is just one vertical, as I said, within the entire treatment arm. I hope I addressed your question, but um, happy to take any more further. Any other questions from the audience? There's a question there. There's a question. Right there, right there on your, yeah. Please state your name and what you do before, if it's, if it's okay. Um, my name is Nairanjana. I'm in BCZ final year, uh, biotechnology, chemistry, zoology. So you showed us a sample performance appraisal sheet, and I took a picture of that because there were so many factors that I need to go back and go through. <laughs> uh, but you might know that in colleges or in schools, we aren't taught a lot of those things. And then when we go to a workplace, it's very new to all of us. Uh, so how do you think that can be made better? And uh, considering things are getting work from home now, I personally feel a lot of those aspects won't be fulfilled um, maybe sitting in front of your laptop. Absolutely. Yeah. So, a great question. So, the perception is reality. <laughs> you get that? Perception is reality. If you understand that, then you have managed your performance appraisals. Yeah. But I think the, the larger point is, 
um, you don't know everything that is expected out of you. So the good thing would be to spell out what is expected out of you. Very often I find people not willing to ask their managers or their colleagues or peers, what is expected out of me? In a genuinely nice way, not in a negative way, <laughs> okay. So if you ask those questions over a period of time, you'll not get an answer in one shot because this is a very complex performance appraisal sheet, but it is quite normal in many organizations. So the question is, what is it that will, what is it that is the, the right behavior perceived by the manager who's going to assess you? But more important, I would always say, think about what impact you're creating. What is it that you really are doing? Are you more productive? Have you learned more so that you can be faster, better, cheaper? What is it that you're really, really doing? Is your quality improving every day? Did you make five mistakes on the first day and only one on the 10th day of your work life? What is it that you're learning? If you're willing to observe yourself, then you're automatically on that path and appraisals will be cakewalk. So I think rather than a performance appraisal, what I would ask you to do is to do a self-appraisal. Don't trust and believe your manager because that is perception. Reality, you know. Measure yourself on yourself, by yourself. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I've got one here. Uh, so I'm Ritika from uh, first year BCB, which is Biotech, Chemistry, and Botany. Um, I wanted to ask, like you said, many graduates from India currently would prefer to do their masters abroad because subjects are better, faculty is better, universities are better. At least that's how it's perceived. So if you want to contribute to India as someone who you know, stayed back after their graduation, uh, what is an incentive to stay back in the healthcare or research industry? What are the current developments in that field? So each, nothing is right or wrong is my opinion. Um, uh, you can be a patriot and you can say that you have to stay back and that's, you know, how can you leave your country and all of that. But I, I'm not a believer in that, actually. I, that's not the motivation to stay back or not to stay back. I think you can contribute to humanity from wherever you are in the world and you can contrib contribute to your country from wherever you are in the world. I, I don't think, my opinion is that you should be biased to take your decisions on that criteria. So let's get that out of the way first. The second would be, what is it that you're gonna learn, what infrastructure that you're gonna get access to, uh, including sometimes faculty, but I'd say sometimes faculty here are as good or better. That's not often the criteria. Sometimes it's the infrastructure um, and access to infrastructure that, um, that you might want to prioritize one over the other. Cost is a big factor, of course, in taking many of these decisions, right? So is there an appropriate ROI or return on investment on your, on your investment uh, in the future is often a big issue in taking these decisions. And I think studying these universities more and making sure that you have a first-hand information or at least a second-hand information, but not just going by brochures or websites will be a critical factor in taking those decisions. I would say speak to people and make sure that your decision is based on real data rather than perceptions of your data because you may go down the wrong path. Because I have seen a lot of people take decisions like this, spend thousands of dollars and come back with um, nothing in there because they've not really done a full due diligence of, uh, of that return on investment. There are very good universities in India. In fact, I will use this opportunity to say I was, I was there in IIT Bombay recently and I used to visit IIT Mumbai very often earlier. And um, it is a phenomenal infrastructure that you can see in IIT Bombay, in IIC Bangalore, in the National Center for Biological Sciences here, or the Jawaharlal Nehru Advanced Re Sciences and Re Clinical Re uh, uh, Center for Research Institute, all in Bangalore. There are institutes in Hyderabad, Delhi, Mumbai, you know, all of the larger big cities, and even in the, some of the tier two cities in India. So there is a lot that has changed. So please do your research in that sense before you take those decisions, I think. That's it, I think.
There's a question at the guy. Okay, there's one here. I can't hear you. Any other questions here in the meantime? I've got one here. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am uh, Rosanne from MSc Biotech. Okay. MSc Biotech first year. Uh, my question was, like, in your company, uh, for drug design, could you describe a typical day of a person doing research there? And is there scope for MSc Biotech degree yeah. to um, join the team? Yes. The answer is yes to the second one. Uh, we often hire MSc Biotechs uh, or even sometimes Bachelor's Biotechs. Um, before you come for any job interview with an organization like ours or any others, I would say learn a little bit about what you're getting in there for, okay? Don't go blind uh, just because of your qualification. There are a million people like yourselves, or if not a million, maybe 100,000. So just be careful that your CV is obviously there. That's why you got a job interview call, but more importantly, that you've done a prep work. There are many, many applications of the basic scientific knowledge that you've picked up over the last, say, six years when you, once you finish your MSc, right? So, or five to six years. So the question is the applications of that, because you know uh, the working of the, the human body, you know a little bit about uh, basic sciences in terms of application. The scientific thinking has been honed, let's say, over the last five, six years. Your problem solving from a scientific and a data collection perspective has probably been honed, and that is what is being looked for. So the jobs could be many. For example, they could be, um, at, at a starting level, it could be what is called data capture, uh, where electronic data is, uh, data is entered electronically into a system. A lot of the data from the patient is collected. Uh, you need to understand the data. You need to mine the data, or at least uh, analyze the data, whether it is clean, uh, before you go into statistics. Uh, you need to enter it. You need to coordinate between various agencies, for example. You need to make sure that the drug that is being kept is maintained in a reasonably st appropriate storage condition. So you need somebody with basic science skills, but also increasingly with the soft skills that I told you. So clinical research requires a lot of soft skills. I think that's true for now all industries. So the answer to that question is yes. And I would say uh, go prepared before a lot of super specialization is now coming in. There are diploma programs, there are fellowship programs that are available for students with MSc degrees so that the organizations are able to filter from those who are really showing interest and they have done something to demonstrate their interest in that specific area before you go for the job interview. Maybe doing internships, maybe uh, walking through some of the organizations, um, talking to some of the people in the industry, in a smaller forum could be ways in which you can learn a little bit more about that industry before you go and apply for it. All right, we take one last question for Sir? today. So, uh, here. I'll take this one. Go for it. Uh, I'm from Rohan from uh, first year of BCZ, Biotech and Zoology. Now, as you know, like the first years, uh, they don't know much of the field work. We know the theoretical stuff but not field work. So if I'm uh, applying as an intern for any biotech or uh, biological life sciences uh, related company, what will the company expect from us? Like uh, wha what should we learn? So most organizations understand that you will be coming in pretty cold in, into the organization, right? So they will have their own training programs uh, in terms of what is expected. So I don't think you need to be so worried about bringing in ready to use knowledge and skills in clinical research or trial development or drug development or you know cell therapy or genetic editing or whatever right you don't need to worry about that of course uh, the questions would be uh, related to what you have learned because what is being tested is whether you have shown diligence whether you understand basic concepts or you have just got a degree Right? Are, you, are you really capable of answering the questions is what is being tested when you're getting to the job. Rest of it is going to be on-the-job training. Uh, focus on behavioral skills and competencies as much as you believe that technical knowledge is going to be tested. 
I had a continuation for that. Like we haven't even uh, still received the degree for a bachelor. We are just doing the uh, completed the first year. So how will the company, you know, up, uh, uh, like expect uh, again? We haven't even still received any degree, right? The company will not pick you um, because <laughs> that's a simple answer. But you have to find a way to get into the company. The point is, I think. Um, I'll take other questions if you don't mind. What, what I'm going to say is I think what you need to do is to use the opportunities that you have weekends, summer vacation, or all breaks every day. If you're surely interested, use the time that you have now onwards. If you're still in the first year, you have a tremendous opportunity for the next maybe two years, right? So I'm saying grab the time opportunity that you have, if any, to start working towards it. Don't work towards a specific um, a type of job, but more importantly, do what you're doing now better. Okay? Uh, so thank you so much. That's all the time we have for questions today. Okay. Yes, all sir. Right. Yes. There was one, but I think we are out of time. Um, is there? Let's have a short question if that is it, or we are done. All right. Sir, I have it. Yeah, a short question, please. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Joe James from 2MBTY. So, my question is that. Um, for example, we already have a, a drug developed and it's formulated, R&D is done. And what are the further um, procedures that we have to follow to have a startup or start up a company with the formulation? Okay, not a short question. So you can meet me just after the break. Right now, if you want to meet, okay? What's right. it? Thank you so much. Joseph James, right? Okay, after the break. Thank you. Uh, Suresh so, Ramu, sir, first of all, congratulations now for such a brilliant presentation. Thank you. That was fitting for our uh, life science students and the chemistry students now who are all here, undergraduate and masters now in life sciences. So I was really impressed now the way you presented and your voice now like the baritone now slowly entering into our ears now then. Okay, I think that's the kind of feel I got. So I was really impressed. And how you put it now, the necessary skills are required for our students. Okay, that is, I was, uh, I mean, more or less, no, that was a point I understood. More than that, the values, no, you put it in one slide, because we always, no, try to inculcate the values, no, in, in our students in Christ Christites. So a little bit of clarification regarding that fifth component, grit. Okay, I think other things are all we are able to understand. And if you are able to do a little bit of clarification on that, because you know, we believe, uh, I mean, a lot of things in the values when they go out of the institution. I think with that, no, I am happy about if you could give a little bit of clarification on that fifth the, point, when, grit. When the professor says uh, you have extra time, it's okay. Okay, so, so I'm going to use that extra time. So grit is basically perseverance and determination, or passion for something, and then you are willing to persevere for it. And it could be anything, but it is really the true test that is going to come in all our lives, right? And I think that uh, all the values have to be demonstrated values. So if I ask myself, am I a truthful person, I will obviously say yes. But there's no point in saying that unless I demonstrate it in difficult situations, right? Uh, in clinical research, we always say that data is absolutely critical. And the uh, integrity of the data is very vital. So at 1 o'clock at night, you're on your two-wheeler. There is nobody inside. There is no policeman inside. There is a red signal in front of you. What would you do? Assuming it's safe, of course. You need to be worried about your safety. But assuming it is safe, would you stop at the signal or would you break it because every other person is breaking it and going forward? That is an example of integrity because you're not monitored and yet you're able to demonstrate it. Similarly, grit is about your own answer to the question that amidst all the challenges and difficulties that you're facing every day of your life, do you have the determination, do you have the passion to hold your ground and move forward? Are you still focused on the goal that you want to achieve? Is grit. And I think uh, it's probably over a period of our lifetime that these values can be demonstrated. But individual instances 
is when you get tested to see whether you really have it or what efforts you're making to improve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that eye-opening session. I'm sure all of us are going home with immense takeaways from today. Uh, as a token of appreciation, I would now request Professor Benny Sebastian to kindly hand over the memento to our esteemed speaker. With that, we have come to an end for today's event. Thank you to all the faculty members, members of the management, council members and volunteers for being the backbone behind the smooth run of the event. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. We hope that each one of you present here will take home a slice of new learnings for your future endeavors and that you are one step closer to understand your career paths better. With that, thank you so much and have